For some time now, I've been interested in a discovery about human behavior called self-image psychology. You may already be familiar with the self-image idea. This is the principle that each of us is controlled by his mental picture of himself. If you thought much about it, I'm sure you agree that a good self-image is vital to our happiness and to the treatment of our goals in life. But if you aren't yet familiar with this new idea, let me introduce it by quoting my old friend, Dr. Maxwell Miles, who said the most important psychological discovery of this century is the discovery of the self-image. Our self-images are our own conception of the sort of person I am. Each of us builds a self-image out of his beliefs about himself. It's unconsciously formed from past experiences, our successes and failures, our humiliations and triumphs. It determines the way we interpret other people's reactions to us. In short, it's a mental picture we have of ourselves. It turns out to be a kind of life-governing device. But as the most significant part of the whole self-image principle that our mental picture determines our interpretation of everything that goes on about us, our reactions to life and other people, our feelings, thoughts, actions, even our abilities, we are the person we believe ourselves to be if we're anywhere near normal and we're consistently that person in everything. It's interesting, isn't it? It's exciting, too, when we realize that self-image can be changed. If for one reason or another, we've developed an image too limited to promote our achieving maximum results in life. But the image can be a much improved. There's one point to keep in mind here, though. We can't outgrow the limits we impose on ourselves. Our thoughts, habits, even our abilities must be those of the person we believe ourselves to be. We can set new limits in place of organs, but we can't surpass the limits of our current self-image. There's a story about a Wisconsin farmer who was walking to his fields one day when he stumbled over a little glass jug in his pumpkin patch. Out of curiosity, probably pumpkins on the back of a jug being careful not to break the bone. Then he places a little experiment back on the ground and walked away. When harvest time came, the farmer was working his way down the road, big red pumpkins, when he again came upon the glass jug. But this time, it looked different. Picking it up, he discovered that the young pumpkin broke the inside, now completely filled its glass prism, having no more room. It had stopped growing, but finally broke the jug and held in his hand a runt pumpkin less than half the size of all the other pumpkins and exactly the shape of the jug. Well, people aren't pumpkins, but our self-image in something like that jug, it determines the size and kind of person we become. The similarity ends with the fact that we can remove our self-imposed limitations by enlarging our self-image. We form a mental picture of ourselves to experience. We form a mental picture of ourselves to experience. We can change that picture the same way to experience the actual experience we need is not available to us. We can, according to self-image psychology, create that experience synthetically. Now scientists agree that the human nervous system is incapable of distinguishing between actual experience and the same experience imagined vividly and improbably. Details. Worry is a good example of this synthetic experience. When a person worries about something, he projects himself mentally, emotionally, and physically into a situation that hasn't even occurred. The man who worries intensely about, well, Say failure finds himself experiencing the same reactions that accompany actual failure feelings of anxiety, inadequacy and humiliation, and eventually headaches and an upset stomach, as well as his mind and body are concerned. He has failed, and that he worries about it long enough, that he concentrates on failure intensely enough. He will upset himself to the extent that he will fail and he will get sick. Now. Everything can be used in either of two ways, positively or negatively, constructively or destructively. Worry is the negative use of creative imagination. It's a negative synthetic experience. But most people apparently never realize that positive results, just as well as the negative result of worry, can be achieved through using our imagination constructively. Our minds are complex and marvelous, but like electronic computers, they can only act on the data we feed them. The man who worries about failure is unwittingly defeating himself. He's feeding his mind the wrong data. 
if he spent the same amount of time visualizing success as he spends thinking about failure, he can reverse the process of synthetic experience. Instead of anxiety, he cares about confidence, self-assurance, poise, and a feeling of well-being would replace apprehension by concentrating on the success he desires. By synthetically experiencing that success, he can expand his self-image into that of a person from success is normal expected. Well, I practice holding the self-image of the person you most want to become. This is the person you can become. If you feel you'd like to enlarge your self-image, then I'd like to invite you to join me in some image building during the next few weeks. Listen to this message at least once a day. This, where you firmly implanted in your mind the concept of the self-image. Use your spare moments to concentrate on your goals and the greater success you seek. Analyze your past successes and formulate ways your success could be increased in the future. Well, on the way to work between appointments while waiting to see a client, these are all excellent times for directing your attention to positive constructive thoughts. Put more into the positive use of your imagination than you ever put into. It's negative use. Worry you're merely reversing the same creative process. Now it's working for you instead of against you. Since the mind works best when we feed it only one set of instructions, do not worry if you can help it during the course of this exercise. Your creative imagination can emerge your self-image appreciably in just three weeks, and it will if you just read it. Nobody books us in the glass prisons beyond which we can't grow. But all too often, almost unknowingly, we set unnecessary limits for ourselves by holding a self-image that restrictive inadequate for the full realization of our potentialities. Each of us is, at this moment, the product of all his thoughts and experiences and environment. Up to this point, through thought, we can control to an almost unbelievable degree both our experience and our environment. From here on, whether or not we choose to direct our own course through life is entirely up to us. The important thing is to know that it can be done. Every business, every organization from the smallest to the very largest needs a leader. They have their committees, their echelons of command, and perhaps a widely dispersed group of semi-autonomous divisions. But the overall company in each of its divisions must have strong and able leadership. Contrary to popular belief, you do not raise morale in an organization. It filters down from atop. The attitudes of the people working in any organization will always reflect the attitude of the leader. And finally, this body will always be found to be just one person. I'm sure you're aware that even the largest and oldest companies with many thousands of employees and hundreds of management people will, when they find themselves in trouble, are not doing as well as they should seek out one man and place him in the position of final authority. The whole company, the board of directors and perhaps thousands of stockholders, all look to this one person for leadership and success. Where were you? Find a successful going concern, whether it's a government, a business, a club, or a well-organized home. You find behind it success an outstanding leader. This is the most valuable president society in industry. He makes the wheels turn the entire economy work. This is the man who's been responsible for the growth of nations and their position in the world. He's the employer of millions, is the dreamer, the planner. And a clock to him is something that other people watch. You'll find him working early and late, and when he's not working, he's usually planning. Back during the depression of the 30s, a phrase most often heard by employers was, I don't do anything. Millions were unemployed. Thousands of business firms have closed their doors and outside employment offices. Long lines of people stood waiting for any kind of work. It was during this time in Long Beach, California, crowded to overlowing with thousands who had migrated there looking for work. I know because I was a kid there, and you made an interesting discovery. He found that he could go to work almost anywhere he chose. Our amazing as this may sound is true. It dawned upon him one day that the business establishments of various kinds were just as anxious to succeed as were the people looking for work. The owners and managers of these businesses were worried and concerned over the hard times 
which had descended upon the country, and a great many of them were looking for someone to come to their aid, the person who would somehow show up and solve their business problems. But all they heard was people asking for work and saying, I'll do anything. These people were asking for a paycheck from a man who was very likely teetering on the brink of financial ruin himself. And so signs appeared in windows all over the land reading, No Help Wanted. This was a negative form of advertising. And while it kept the printed cards away from the door, it also hurt business. Well, this friend of mine decided to become a part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. And his method was simple, and it worked like a charm. He selected the kind of business he felt he would like to work in and in which he could build his career. He then devoted a month to finding out all he could about that particular business. He talked to other people in the same line. He heard their problems and what they thought was wrong. He talked for hours asking questions about what they felt was needed and so on. He went to the public library and read everything he could find on that industry. And then he began to think of ways and means by which this business might be improved. When he was ready and finally made his call at the company for which he decided to work instead of asking for a job, he said something like this, I believe I know several ways in which your business can be greatly increased, and I'd like to talk to you about them. Well, here he was selling the one thing on earth in which his prospect was most interested. The fact that he now knew a good deal about the man's problems permitted him to talk intelligently. And he took a positive attitude, expressed a willingness to pitch in and help the man put his business on the sound and profitable footing. That's right. He got the job that ought to be done. Well, first in Specialized, he had selected one line of work and decided that was where his future would be. Now he had to prove himself, and he did. The best way for you to develop the security that lasts a lifetime is to become outstanding at one particular line of work. Look at it this way. Regardless of economic ups and downs, the industry of which that line of work is applied will continue to operate. It won't shut down completely. As long as you're in the top 5% of the people in that industry, you know, you'll always be in demand. You'll be wanted and needed, not just where that industry is concerned, but where you and your family are concerned. Also, the man or woman who becomes truly outstanding at what he or she does has the world on a string. He is the person of confidence and peace of mind. He was the person who was quietly aware of his ability and intimate knowledge of his job at his particular industry. Ask yourself this question, am I now such a person? Down deep inside, you know the answer. If your answer is yes, you're among the most fortunate people and in one of the smallest and most elite groups on earth. If your answer was no, it can be turned into a yes. In a surprisingly short time, the first step is to make one really big and important decision. It's a decision the great majority of people never make and suffer as a result. Failing to make this decision keeps a person from ever really getting on course or clarifying his goals. If you make the decision, I'm now going to recommend you can take a deep breath, give a comfortable sigh of relief. Fix your eyes firmly upon your target and go to work. Relaxed, comfortable, ensure the knowledge that the success you seek will be yours. The great steel magnate Andrew Carnegie, when asked the formula for success, answered, put all your eggs in one basket, then watch the basket, then watch the basket. Let's be frankly realistic. Who gets laid off work during an economic slump? Well, what gets thrown over the side when a ship is in danger of going down? Everything that absolutely vital to the operation of the craft and the safety of its passengers. And it's the same with a business or any other organization with a corporation. Its main purpose is to remain in business forever. As long as it remains in business, it can provide a needed product or service, protect the investment of those who have faith in it, and provide jobs for those who are vital to its continuity of operation. It's the duty of management to protect the firm and the people who depend upon it. Just as it's the captain's duty to do everything in his power to keep Bishop serving, all a person needs to do is to make certain that he or she is a vital part of his business or organization. 
Those who insist on remaining spare gear must expect to be jettisoned when things get too rough for safety. Nobody, particularly the captain, likes to see cargo thrown over the side, but if it'll help save the ship, there's simply nothing else to do. That's why people are laid off. It has nothing to do with management and labor relations or personalities, and in the long run, it's best for everyone. Since once smooth sailing has again been reached, additional employment can be made available. So each of us must decide whether we want to be part of the cargo or a member of the crew. It's said that merely a separate today from a malady called an a-phobia, uh, that a phobia means fear of everything. It's an uneasy feeling, a feeling of insecurity that generally manifests itself as a sort of lump of fear that settles right behind the belt buckle, especially on a Sunday evening and on Monday morning. And this extremely unpleasant condition is said to result from the unspoken but realized track that we're getting credit for more than we're actually doing. It's the perfectly natural and normal. Understood ending deep within each of us that there's something basically wrong about getting praise that's not earned. Or if you are an employee being paid for something, you're not doing as well as you possibly can. Now, there's a simple cure for this malady. It strips ourselves out of a window, but into activity, into our work. If the decision to be worth more than we're being paid, only in this way can we grow. It's overbalancing the scales in the service we give, knowing that our rewards must follow as a natural result. Now, anyone who will be honest with yourself realizes that he's been happiest and most satisfied after having successfully completed a difficult job. You know, a leader is a person who can help others. A leader is any person who realizes the importance of becoming a bigger and better person with the passing of every day, week, and month. I think to take the responsibility of his own growth. He's a planner, a thinker, a doer. Now each of us can become such a leader in his own area of activity. It's not difficult, and in the long run, it's easier for us and honest, and what at first may appear to be the easier of two courses. Simply picture your eye upon your goal. Visualize it with every ounce of your being and courageously set out toward it to become a kind of sponge for information which will help you on your way. You don't have to waste years making the mistakes others had made before. You'll be surprised at how quickly you reach your goal. But don't be impatient. No one had faith that what should come to you will come to you at the right time. Everything in the world works on the side of the person who works with nature's laws. And above all, if you should forget everything else, remember that everything about you, everything you will ever have no experience in any way, operates as a result of a law that is true and unchanging. The law of the stars and of the balance of the world, as Emerson wrote, let him learn a prudence of a higher strain. Let he learn that everything in nature, even dust and feathers, go by law and not by luck, and that what he sows, he reaps. Look about you now, take stock of your present situation, because it's nothing more, no less than the result of your past showing. Are you happy with it? Is it what you want? Then you know what you would sow. Sow today and tomorrow and the next day, and in the sowing, rest in a calm, serene, and cheerful certainty that having sown you will then reap the rich results, the abundant harvest.